Hello and welcome to our continuing look at Luther's Small Catechism. If you have on hand your Luther's Small Catechism with explanation here with the black and burgundy cover, we're going to be on page 52 of our book, page 52, as we have an introduction to the Ten Commandments. Last time that we met, we had a brief discussion on the history and purpose of the catechism. Now we're diving into the first of the six chief parts, the Ten Commandments. So as you look at this, you're going to see that uh, there's some important things that we need to address here. Uh, one such thing deals with the numbering of the commandments uh, within various denominational traditions, there are different numberings of the Ten Commandments. And that's um, kind of an interesting thing. Some people interpret um, things that people consider as a commandment as simply a further explanation of a commandment and so forth. Um, if you're interested, you can find a comparison online uh, Lutherans tend to follow a historic format, not just laid out by Luther, but also some within the Jewish faith and some of the early church fathers. So we're going to be looking at the catechisms in that particular order. I'm not going to get into the others right now. But on page 53, you'll notice question number 15. It says, what are the Ten Commandments? The Ten Commandments are God's law, his good and loving will for the lives and well-being of all people. Now, this is an important um, question here, this idea of God's law, in that as we look at these commandments, as we, we call them that in English, in Hebrew, they don't call them the Ten Commandments. They are the Ten Words. And in fact, they actually have a, um, a Greek name, the Decalogue, meaning Ten Words. So we call them commandments, but that is a very limiting term. And the reason for that is because there are really uh, two particular understandings. Uh, Luther describes the commandments as having a prescriptive um, perspective and a descriptive. So the prescriptive is like a prescription. It tells you what you are to do. And so God's Ten Commandments, the Ten Words, do tell us this is what you should do. This is what you should not do. That is the uh, prescriptive uh, understanding of the Ten Commandments. However, Luther also presents us with something called the descriptive, and that really is a, a perspective where we see uh, how we as God's people are, that describes who we are. So, for instance, um, you shall have no other gods. Now, you can understand that as a law. Don't have any other gods. However, that being the prescriptive understanding, the descriptive understanding is because you are my people and I am your God, you will not have any other gods. I'm the only God that you need. So as we go through this, we're going to see in each of the commandments both a prescriptive and a descriptive understanding of these commandments. So let's continue here as we go through this with question 16. What is God's will for our lives? All right. So this is a question that so many people have, whether they're young people in school or getting into college or um, as they look later on in their life. Uh, what is God's will for our lives? Well, Luther writes, um, or the Catechism tells us, God wants us to trust in him above all else, to love him and to love our neighbor. This really is the essence of what it is to be a child of God, to trust in God, our Father, for all things, that he provides for us and protects us in every way. And so we also, in response, love him. We, we love him as we would love our parents, but even greater than that. And also then to love our neighbor. 
because God provides for us, he cares for us, he surrounds us with his old holy angels, protects us, all of these wonderful things, we then can and ought to love our neighbor uh, as best we can in a very similar way. So um, I don't have to worry about providing for your well-being because God provides everything that I need to support my body and life. And because he does that, I can freely do the same thing. I can give for you and help you knowing that I cannot outgive the provision of God, right? So one of the verses here is, is very interesting. Um, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, for this is the will of God, your sanctification. Now we're going to talk about sanctification at a much later date, but Really, what that means is your holiness, that you are holy, both in the sight of God and in your interactions with other people. So we're going to talk about this now. The little note there um, under question 16 is very important. Quit, Christians often distinguish the commandments in two parts. Those that pertain to love for God, those are the first three commandments and those that pertain to love for the neighbor, the last seven commandments. And we call them the two tablets or the two tables of the law, since we know that God wrote his commandments on two stone tablets. So the first three commandments deal with our vertical relationship between God, between us and God and God and us. The second seven commandments deal with our horizontal relationship between us and other people. And if you look at it rightly, you'll see a cross shape in that, that vertical relationship with God and that horizontal relationship with other people. So when we look at this, the, the two tables or the two tablets, the first table or first tablet you shall have no other gods. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, and you shall remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. See, so those, those all deal with our relationship with God. The second table, you shall honor your father and your mother. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. And you shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his manservant or maidservant, his ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Right. And see, all of those deal with our relationship with other people. Now, from here, question 17 asks, how did God give his law to us? Now, that is a very interesting question because there's not just one plain, simple answer. First, God wrote these instructions, his law, upon the heart of every human creature. See, all people have a conscience. We, we know inwardly without being, so I know right away if I do something without having been told whether I should or shouldn't do it, very often I know if I'm doing something wrong, right? I don't necessarily have to be told that uh, stealing candy from a store is wrong. I don't have to be told that um, driving over uh, a, you know, something uh, and killing it on on purpose is is bad. Right? These sorts of things are very important for us to understand. This inward understanding that's our conscience. Our conscience is there to. Uh, remind us how we are to live as Christians. So, for instance, uh, Romans 2.14 and following, St. Paul writes, For when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do what the law requires, they are a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts while their conscience also bears witness, and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them on that day, when, according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. So 
you don't even have to be told that certain behaviors are wrong or certain behaviors are God pleasing. That's that's something that we know just in our hearts. Now on page 54, the second thing talks about God writing the Ten Commandments on stone tablets for the people of Israel. So this is kind of like what you have um, in your town. If you go to the city hall and you want to know what the laws are, the ordinance are, ordinances are, rules in your town, you can go there and you can, you're really that interested, you can read through the laws, right? Uh, as Americans, we have a constitution which sets forth particular things that we are to do and what we can do, right? The rights that we have. But we also have laws within our nation, both within our nation and within our state also, laws that tell us this is what we should do, this is what we shouldn't do. And God himself writes those in the Ten Commandments so that if we're wondering how, you know, what I should do, I can look at the Ten Commandments and know, no, I shouldn't do this, or yes, I can do this. Now, as I mentioned, there are these different uh, numbering methods. They really don't play a vital role in understanding the commandments. Uh, the only one that really is of any uh, interesting discussion regards the uh, commandment uh, by that some Christians hold to, uh, you shall not make a graven image. Now, we Lutherans incorporate that within the first commandment, right? If you're not supposed to have any other gods, creating a graven image or a statue or something and worshiping that is having another god. So that really is a commentary, um, a further explanation of the first commandment. But for some Christians, that is a separate commandment all to itself. Um, but we really don't focus on that too much. Now, on page, I'm sorry, in the middle of page 54, the third way that God gives us his law is through particular instructions throughout the Bible. And as you go through the Bible, there are, again, specific things that God tells us we are to do, specific things that he tells us we should not do. And that is also the law of God. Now, often these are much more specific cases, specific things and statements regarding these Ten Commandments. So they're not so much separate as much as they are just um, giving us a further understanding of each of these commandments. Question number 18 says, how does God use the Ten Commandments in our lives and the lives of others in the world? All right, this is important. God uses these Ten Commandments in three particular ways, his law in three particular ways. So as Lutherans, we call these the three uses or the three functions of the law. So the very first thing that God does when he uses his law is to try and keep us from doing particular things that we should not do, right? Uh, this is called the curb of the law, the first use. So it's like when you're in a car and you're driving down your street, uh, there's curbs on the side. And part of the main reason for that is to keep you on the straight path of the road so that you don't drive up onto the sidewalk and run into people or run into their house or their car. So the curb is there to keep you along the straight and narrow path, right? So that's what the curb of the law does. The second use of the law, oh, this, is the, this is the really hard one. This is the mirror of the law. Um, if you ever sit and um, don't look in front of a mirror, uh, but you just sit and stare straight in front of you, I know there's going to be a few people out there that are going, well, I can do it, I can do it. But if you look in front of you without a mirror or a screen or anything like that, you cannot see what you look like. 
you only can see what you look like in part because of a reflection. So right now, as I'm talking to my computer, I can see what I look like. I can see the white in my beard and my glasses. I can see those things only because I see the reflection. I can't see that without that reflection. So if I really want to know what it is I look like, if I want to see the whiteness in my beard or the, the wrinkles starting to form by my eyes and that sort of thing, I have to have a reflection. And so the second use of the law is called the mirror. And God uses this to show us who and what we really are in our sinfulness. This shows us our sin. It reveals and condemns our sin. That's what the mirror of the law does. I don't know that I'm a sinner unless the law tells me that I am a sinner. And so that's what the mirror does. So if I wonder, uh, did I do something contrary to God's will? Well, I look at the law and the law says, yep, you did. All right, then I'm I'm revealed. I, I see myself for what I really am. And for instance, uh, St. Paul says in Romans 3.20, for by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. All right, so we have the first two uses. We have the curb that keeps us on the straight and narrow, and we have the mirror that shows us our sin. Now, both of these apply to both Christians and non-Christians, believers and non-believers, right? The law even keeps an atheist on the straight and narrow. An atheist knows that murder is wrong, even though they are not a believer in God. So the law does that. Um, an atheist, for instance, will also know that if they have murdered someone, that that is wrong. And the law will show them that that is wrong. So the, the first two uses apply both to Christians and non-Christians alike. The third use, now this one is interesting because this one only applies to believers. So the first is the curb, the second is the mirror, the third is the guide. This is kind of like the GPS of the law. It tells us where I am to go, how I am to live, what I am to do. And so God uses the third use of the law to direct my thoughts, my words, and my actions in a God-pleasing manner. How do, how do I know how to treat my brother or sister? Well, God's law tells me this is how I am to do this. Um, how should I think about um, particular people? Right? How should I um, act toward my president that I don't like? Uh, how should I act toward my teacher who I think doesn't like me? Um the law tells me that I'm to be respectful of them, even when I don't like them or when I think they don't like me. And right? I'm supposed to think of them in a respectful manner. I'm supposed to speak of them respectfully. I'm supposed to treat them with respect. So that's what the third use of the law does. It is the guide. It tells me how I am to live. Now, another thing about that that's very important when we talk about the law is what uh, we like to call the SOS. Uh, if you're familiar at all with anything in movies or in books, you often know that SOS is like a distress call uh, for boats, and it means save our ship. Like if you're out in the water in the ocean and your ship is sinking, you send out an SOS. That's a cry for help. We also have a couple of SOSs when we're talking about the commandments. Now, the first SOS is that the law shows our sin. That's primarily the mirror, that second use of the law. It shows our sin. But there is a gospel SOS. The gospel is that which God does for us. It is God's saving action for our benefit. 
So whereas the law SOS shows us our sin, the gospel SOS shows us our Savior. The gospel points us to Jesus' death on the cross and his resurrection from the dead. So that we know that we cannot keep the law perfectly. We sin all the time. And yet God in his mercy sends Jesus to keep the law perfectly, to die on behalf of us, to die for our sins in our place, to die our death. And so the gospel OS, SOS is that it shows us our Savior. All righty. And that's why then, as we look at question number 19, why is the second use of the law so important? It shows us that we all have sinned and cannot keep God's commandments. And so it makes known our need for the gospel of Christ, who is the fulfillment of the law. The law always accuses. Anytime I look at God's law, um, you know, you shall have no other gods, that's going to accuse me because maybe I put football practice. Uh, maybe I put um, stock shows. Uh, maybe I put volleyball. Maybe I put um, choir or even my family before God and, and study of his word. And by doing that, I am placing anything else before God. I am violating the law of God, right? So the law always accuses us, shows us that we cannot keep God's law perfectly at all. But that then leads us to the next question, which is, what is sin? On page 56, what is sin? Question number 20. Sin is humanity's fallen condition. Uh, if you remember, sometimes in our service, we say that we are by nature sinful and unclean, that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. Right? Our sin is first off that we are sinful. Now, this is important. There are some Christian churches that will tell you that you're only a sinner if you do sins. Uh, we Lutherans understand the biblical perspective, which says that I sin, I do sins, because my very nature is corrupt. I am a sinner, and so then I do sin. So that's a very unique thing between Lutherans and other Christians. We believe that we sin because we are sinners, whereas many other Christians will say that they're sinners only because they do sin. So if they just stop sinning, then they wouldn't be sinners anymore. But sin is in that we, are, we have turned away from God. We no longer look at God. We turn away and we don't look to him for security, uh, for meaning in our life, and for righteousness, for, for being holy. Instead, we actually look to ourselves. And if I'm already corrupt, nothing I have is ever going to be good and right. And so that's what sin is and does. Now, your catechism will note several different uh, conditions or names of sin, uh, debt, disobedience, fault, transgression, unbelief, and so forth. We're not necessarily going to go into each of these, but you are welcome to look at the particular verses listed there to get a better understanding of how each of these is sin. Now, that leads us, though, to a very, uh, very important understanding also, and that's in question 21, how did sin enter God's good creation? See, God makes everything very good, as, as Moses writes in Genesis. God makes everything very good. So there was no sin on earth, no sin in the garden. So how does sin get in there? Well, the devil brings sin into the world by tempting Adam and Eve, who willingly yielded to temptation. So 
This is a, a very important section of God's Word. If you open up your Bible, hopefully you've got your faith alive. If you have a different one, that's okay. Uh, we're going to look, though, at Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 to 6. And so we're going to hear about this bringing of sin into creation. It says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say, You shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. All right, now this is packed full of stuff. We're going to try and pull out a few bits in here. We're not going to try and undo all of the package because, boy, that would take a little bit of time. But we are going to pull out a few particular pieces that are very important. We see in Genesis chapter 2, that God had created the Garden of Eden in the midst of everything. And he places Adam and then, of course, Eve into the garden. And he also puts in the very center of the garden two particular trees. God says you can eat of any tree in the garden, any tree. But then he also mentions these two particular trees. One is the tree of life. One is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, there's a very important thing there. God places a promise with the tree of life. And that promise is, if you eat of this, you live forever, right? You, you continually live. You cannot die. But on this tree, the knowledge of good and evil, he places a promise. He says, if you eat the fruit of this tree, in the day that you eat of it, you shall die. All right, so one's the tree of life. One is the tree basically of death, the knowledge of good and evil. Now, the fruit itself isn't the key. The tree itself isn't the key. It's the promise that is attached to each tree. All right, eat this one, and you live. Eat this one, and you die. All right, eat of this. So the serpent, who is the devil, kind of in a different form, he, maybe you can say that he possesses the snake. Uh, the snake, the serpent, comes up and he speaks to Eve. Now, this is very interesting because when God creates Adam, he creates Adam first. And he tells Adam, you can eat the fruit of this tree, but don't eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So after God makes Eve and she brings or he brings Eve to Adam and says, here, I, I, I made you a, a woman, brought you a woman. Adam's job is to be the pastor. Right. The way you can understand it is this is kind of a church in the middle of the garden. And they worship God by eating the tree are eating the fruit of the tree, trusting in the promise of the tree of life, and rejecting the promise of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, not eating of that, trusting in God by eating of the tree of life. All right? So Adam, he's the pastor, and he's the one who's supposed to tell Eve exactly what God says. Now, of course, we don't know precisely what Adam says. But we get a very interesting look because as the devil comes up like a snake and he says to Eve, uh, did God really say that you're not allowed to eat of any of the trees in the garden? He immediately begins to create doubt. He questions God's word. And really, this is how Satan works even in our world today. 
he asks the question, did God really say? And every temptation, every struggle, everything that goes on in our world that is negative is centered on that particular question. Does God really say? Does God really say that doing this is wrong? Does God really say that I should be doing this? Right? That's that's what Satan uses to try and lead God's people astray, is to cause us to question the word of God. So that's what the devil does. Did God really say that you can't eat of any tree in the garden? Well, right then, by questioning, he begins to mess with Eve's thought processes. And so Eve says, no, 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 that's not it. That's not it at all. Uh, God says that we can eat of anything in the garden, except we should not eat the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, nor shall we touch it. Now, God never says that in the scriptures. We don't know if maybe Adam was trying to help protect her. Um, right. We don't, we don't exactly know. Maybe she made it up on her own. Uh, but automatically as she is questioned, she gets the directions wrong. So then Satan takes that opportunity to kind of take that little hole and spread that hole apart a little bit more. And he says, oh, you're not going to die. God knows that when you eat of it, you're going to know good and evil. Now, God does not desire that Adam and Eve know good and evil. He's already given them the, the, the promise of the tree. He says, don't eat this, right? If they eat it, then they will know good and evil. They'll know what evil is and that it exists. God does not want them to know that, right? But Satan holds it up and he says, hey, God knows. You want to be like God, oh, oh, eat some of this fruit. Now, this right here is a temptation to break the first commandment. You shall have no other gods before me. What Satan is doing, what the devil's doing, is he's tempting Eve to become like God, to literally become a God to herself, right? If she knows something that God knows, then she's going to be like God in her own way. That's a that's a powerful temptation. And that's really what all people try and do. I sin because I desire to place myself in the place of God. So Eve then turns around and she says, huh, well, interesting. Well, the, the tree looks good and the food looks good. So she takes it and she eats. All right, the devil tempts her through questioning God's word and promising her that she will know things that God knows. And she gives in. And when she does that, something even worse happens. So she gives some to her husband who was with her. Now, we don't know where Adam was the whole time. But it almost seems as though Adam was standing there watching this whole thing. And he doesn't stop it. Which, how horrible is that? But we don't really know. Maybe he began to question as he's watching this. And so he follows along. Or, or maybe he was a distance away. And when Eve brought it to him, um, he recognized it and decided to eat it anyways. We really don't know. But what we do know is that this behavior caused the downfall of everything God created. It ruins God's creation. It brings sin into creation, and that, therefore it brings death into creation. St. Paul says the wages of sin is death. Now, Underneath question 21, there's a couple of verses here that are very important. 1 John 3, 8, whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. For the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. Then Romans 5, 12, 
Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. Ugh. And so that leads us to the sec or the question 22. How did Adam and Eve's disobedience affect us? Their sin affects everybody. It corrupts all of creation. And it makes creation to be so corrupt that it can only desire its own desires, right? It, it does not want to please God. It now is at war with God because it's rejected God and desired to make itself to be its own God. It is at war with God. So Adam and Eve's disobedience affects us because we are then, by our very birth and condition, sinners. We are enemies of God. Now, this whole thing is called original sin or inherited sin, right? Original sin or inherited sin. Uh, now, question 23 on page 57 asks the question, how does original sin affect every human creature? Well, there's several different ways. First off, letter A, it says without, it means that every person is now born without the ability to fear and love God. We are spiritually blind and dead. So we don't desire God. We do not love God. We hate God because we are enemies of God. That's who we are in our original sin. Now, somebody will say, I don't do that. Yes, if you are a Christian, you don't do that. But people who are not Christian do not love the true God. They do not fear the true God. They are against God entirely. They are at war with God. And so they cannot, on their own, look for God. They cannot um, try and find God. They cannot love God. None of that can happen on their own. Now, letter B, then, as we mentioned before, says that we now have an endless desire to sin. We are enemies of God. Our every thought, word, and deed, if we are a non-Christian, is focused on ourselves, our own pleasure, our own wants, our own needs, our own desires. We do not and cannot desire anything good in the eyes of God. So we are always wanting to sin, which is trying to please myself as opposed to pleasing God. Letter C says then that we deserve God's temporal, that's earthly, and eternal death sentence. Because we have rejected God, we have rejected his ways, the things that he wants for us, and we want to do our own thing, we deserve death both here in this world and eternal death, eternal separation from God. Now, that's a horrifying thought, and it's something that's very hard, thankfully, for us to even consider, and it should be. But for those people who reject God, that is, unfortunately, the the reward that they will have for them. Finally, original sin means that we are enslaved to a lifelong sinful condition from which we cannot free ourselves. By our sin, we have sold ourselves into slavery to sin, and we cannot ever break ourselves out of it. The only way we can be free is if somebody does something for us. And this is a very important thing that we're going to be talking about more later. So Martin Luther talks about Christians as saints and sinners. In the eyes of the world, we still have our, our old human nature. We still sin. We still do things that we know we shouldn't do. And so that's called our old Adam. But in Jesus, we who believe in Jesus, 
who believe that Jesus died for my sins, rose from the grave, so that all who believe in him have eternal life, we are then saints, which means holy people. So if you ever hear the pastor say we are simultaneously saint and sinner, or in the Latin, simul justus et peccator, that means that while we are still a sinful person here among others, we still do things we shouldn't do, and we don't do things that we should do. In that case, we are still, because we are covered in the blood of Jesus, holy and righteous in the sight of God. So that's called simultaneously saint and sinner. But that also gets us to a question that's not in your catechism, but it is a very important understanding and that's regarding the types of sins. Now, I touched on this very briefly, this idea of original sin. That is the sin committed by Adam and Eve in the garden, the rejection of God's promises, the rejection of God, and the raising up of themselves to the place of God in their own eyes. And then that's passed down to us. So we have that original sin. But there's also actual sins. It's the sins that we actually do, right? So purposely not taking out the garbage when mom asks us to, um, cheating on a test maybe. Um, those sorts of things are actual sins. And so those actual sins can be divided up into two kinds. The first is the sin of commission. And so there's three of those. Thought word and deed. I sin by what I think about somebody, right? If I'm thinking, I hate that person, or I hope that person gets in an accident on their way home, right? That sin of thought, I want something um, bad to happen to that person, or maybe um, there's all kinds of different sins of thought. A sin of word, for instance, is um, if I tell lies about somebody, or if I make a promise that I know I'm not going to keep. So a sin of word. Sin of deed is just that. It's a sin of action. Um, if I punch my sister in the nose um, because I'm mad at her, that's a sin of deed, right? So we have these three different kinds of actual sins. Sins of commission, something I do commit, I commit it. So thought, word, and deed. But there's also sins of omission. A sin of omission is when I don't do something that I'm supposed to do, right? Now, again, we mentioned this before. We sin by thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. Things that I'm not, that, I, that I'm supposed to do that I don't do. Now, that's a very, very important thing also. Well, I didn't do anything. Exactly. That's the problem. You didn't do that. You should have done this and you chose not to. That is a sin of omission. I omit doing it. So as we look at this introduction to the commandments, we get a very broad perspective on what it means when we say the commandments, uh, when we talk about how they affect us, what they mean, and, and their importance for us. So we're going to stop here at the end of, let me see, that's the end of page 57. In our next video, we're going to be looking at the first commandment, the first commandment, you shall have no other gods. All right, thank you so much for your time here. If you have any questions, any um, thoughts, um, any challenges even, uh, feel free to email, text, um, write, call, whatever it is you can do. I'm more than willing to give further explanation and and even deal with correction if you have one. Maybe maybe I said something in a way that I wasn't supposed to. That sometimes happens. Uh, so please feel free to do that. Until then, I do look forward to seeing you in the next video as we look at the first commandment. Until then, may God bless you. Bye-bye.